2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21, page 1161. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Great verses. Um, thank you, Glenda, for reading them to us. Now, come back five years. Do you remember 2014? There was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Big outbreak. Lots of talk on the news about Ebola. And one of the countries particularly hit was Sierra Leone. And there was one story that came out of Sierra Leone which really grabbed me. The BBC speak, spoke loads about it. Do you remember there was a man called William Pooley? So William Pooley, he was a nurse living in rural Suffolk. He had a lovely life, worked as a nurse, local hospital. Um, but when William heard about Ebola in Sierra Leone and all that was going on, William just thought, I've got to go. And so he booked himself a plane ticket, he got on the plane, and he put his nurse's training to good use in Sierra Leone, treating those who had Ebola. No one knows quite how it happened, but as he treated the patients, one day, suddenly it became clear that William himself had contracted Ebola. And you get those sort of classic news headlines. A Brit has Ebola! Missing the fact that 20,000 West Africans have Ebola. Anyway, RAF jets flew William back to the UK, and he was treated. It was a, a trial drug. Um, no one was quite sure how it was going to work, but, but it worked. Miraculously, William recovered. You know what he did? William booked himself a ticket, got back on a plane, and flew back to Sierra Leone. And actually, William... I mean, the news were loving this. Well, what are you doing? Why are you going? And he spoke of a brother and sister who had died, covered in blood, agonizing death from Ebola. And William said, it's not that I want to go. I've got to go. I've got to go and help them and do whatever I can. Now, William makes quite a story. But I want to suggest William's story is nothing compared to the Apostle Paul. Let me tell you about the Apostle Paul. One day, the Apostle Paul went into um, a, a town called Lystra, and as he was there in Lystra telling them about God, the people in Lystra, they didn't like what he was saying. So they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him until they thought he was dead and they left him there. But he wasn't dead. And as he stirred and regained consciousness, he got up and he said, I've still got work to do. And that same day, he went back into Lystra and started telling them, about Jesus Christ. Or another time, Paul was, um, he was locked in prison for telling people about Jesus. It was a common theme. And uh, there was a massive earthquake came and 
The prison falls apart, his chains come off, he's a free man. Now you and I, we're going to run in that situation, but not Paul. What does Paul do? Well, he stays because there's an opportunity to tell the prison jailer about Jesus. And he does. He, he tells the jailer about Jesus. He baptizes the jailer in his household that evening. And he knows that that is what he had to do. That was his work. That was his calling. So ask yourself, what drives this man? What, what makes a man like Paul tick? You've got to ask that question. Have a look down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. This is Paul writing. He says, Since then... We know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope is plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, you can see why they might say that, it is for God. If we're in our right mind, it is for you. Then here's the big moment. Have a listen. Verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died. Died for them and was raised again. Okay, that is the Apostle Paul. Those are brilliant verses for Mission Monday. Paul begins by talking about the fear of the Lord. That's verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. And you're thinking, what do you mean, fear the Lord? Why, why, why are you fearing? Well, if you go back to verse 10, you can see what he's fearing. Paul says, verse 10, all, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is the fear he's talking about. He's got this awesome understanding of a perfect and holy God. A God before whom everyone, you and I, everyone, must one day stand. And we'll have to give an account for our lives. You see, Paul's concern is not about the here and now. Ebola is awful. The effects of Ebola are agonizing. But Paul's got his sights set on something far more fearful. His concern It's for the fate of sinful people standing before a holy God. The Bible is crystal clear on this. The penalty for sin is death. Stand before a holy God in our sinful state. All that awaits us is a certain death. Eternal separation from God and from his blessings. I hope you know that to be true. The Bible is really, really clear on that truth. Jesus is really clear and it is fearful. But it doesn't have to be like that, says Paul. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Do you hear that? We're convinced one died for all, and therefore all died. Paul is saying, look, I don't have to die. I can stand before a holy God and not face eternal death because one died Jesus Christ he died he died and therefore all died his death was my death was your death was William Pooley's death one died for all and therefore all died are you getting the scale of this it's good news but we need to be clear It's good news that needs sharing. What Paul's not saying is, well, you know, Christ has died, so now no one needs to worry about dying anymore. You don't need to worry about standing before a holy God. Everyone's automatically made right by God now. He's not saying that. He can't possibly be saying that. Some people will read it that way, and they'll think, well, I don't need to bother sharing the good news. Well, I mean, what's all this mission stuff? (laughs) Christ died. All died. Do you see the problem, verse 11? He's saying, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord... We try to persuade others. Paul doesn't think this truth means sit back and relax. In fact, it's it's quite quite the opposite. He's saying, look, there's a solution to the problem of sinful people standing before a holy God. Christ has died, so you don't have to die. Let me tell you the solution. 
You need to respond. That, that is Paul. So end of verse 20. He's pleading. He says, we, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Take hold of this wonderful solution God has given you to the problem of your sin. We need to act on it. Now, that is like William Pooley. Just imagine that some clever lab in London came up with the cure for Ebola. It's, it's 100% successful. And actually, it's completely free because some wealthy benefactor, they founded the lab and, and they wanted it to discover this cure and, and they've done it, so there's no cost. And so this big box of the cure gets packaged up in the lab and it gets delivered to William Pooley's home in Suffolk, plonked on his doorstep. And William Pooley, he sees it's arrived. What's he going to do? Brilliant! The solution's there! Puts it in his living room, feet up, watch an episode of EastEnders. Is that what he's going to do? You've got a sense of this man. You know what he's doing with that cure. He's going to be on the first plane out of there. He's heading straight to Sierra Leone, and he's going to make sure everyone he can possibly get to with that cure is going to get that cure. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Can you get the thrust of what Paul is saying? Paul is a man who has seen the love of his Savior. He knows this man, Jesus Christ, God's own son. He was a righteous man. He could stand before our holy God. He had nothing to fear. And yet, because of Jesus' love for you, for me, for all that he had made, he spread out his arms on a cross and he willingly died a death that was your death and my death. He did it so that people might not have to die. That is Christ's love. It's love like you and I have never known. And we won't know it until we are fully in his presence, delighting in it. It is a love which offers us a chance to stand before our holy God without fear. And Paul says it's that love. It is that love that drives us on. Christ's love compels us. But there's more here. Um, there's real help for missionaries in these verses. Let me read on. Verse 17. Have a look down. Uh, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And then verse 20, this is key. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now that is, those are crucial verses for missionaries because as a Christian missionary, you can go one of two ways. You could be the kind of person and you're... Um, Maybe you're sitting chatting with friends, maybe school canteen, I don't know what the context might be. And as the conversation moves on, you suddenly realise, well, hang on a sec, there's a chance here to talk about Jesus. It feels like a real open door. And you're left thinking, well, hang on a sec, this is big. I, I don't want to stuff this up, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. They, they need to know about Jesus, I'm going to stuff it up. And, and you're left sort of playing through the conversation, what should I say? And you know what happens... You manage to convince yourself just to stay silent, to take the conversation in a different direction, because you're worried you're going to mess it up. So better not to say anything, too scared to get it wrong. Do you see what we're being told here? All this, this is verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. If you're that person in the canteen and you end up convincing yourself to stay silent, you need to be very clear that this is God's work, not your work. Paul's very clear. 
He's saying, no, God is doing the reconciling. If I'm getting very anxious about every conversation I ever have about the Christian faith, I've forgotten that. I've started to convince myself that I'm the reconciler, that it all rests with me. You and I can't bear that responsibility. Just imagine if the eternal destiny of your friend really did rest in your hands. It doesn't. God is the reconciler. That is one way to get wrong. But the other way to get it wrong is to convince ourselves, well, if it's God's work... Well, he doesn't need me. I mean, he's God. He can do anything. Why would he use little me? Saves me all those awkward conversations if I don't have to um, play a part in this. He can just get on and do it. But I love these verses. These verses won't let us land there. Look, it's God's work, not ours. But how does God do his work? He does his work through you and through me. All this, verse 18 again, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Or verse 19, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Is that not extraordinary? God, the creator God, making his appeal to his creation through us, through you. He's got this wonderful message, this hope that the world needs to hear. Christ died for you. This forgiveness for your guilt, company director sitting on John's chair. You need to hear it. How are you going to hear it? Well, God's given that message to us to share with those around us. This is big. You see, God's normal way of working is not actually booming voices or signs in the sky or dreams. That does happen. There are some wonderful, wonderful testimonies of the way God has done extraordinary things to bring people to be followers of him. That does happen. But actually, most of the time, he chooses not to. His his normal way of working, the normal way he he chooses to spread this message of reconciliation is through conversations over a, a cup of coffee or conversations down the pub, or, or friends thinking through the issues in the school canteen. It's very ordinary, it's very normal. It's an extraordinary message, but he, he delivers it through ordinary messengers. Christ making his appeal through us. His love compels us, and he makes his appeal through us. Now, you and I live in a world where we're constantly being told that no one is interested in God. Have you heard that? No one's interested in God. Don't talk about God. In fact, um, when I was an engineer, we had a company notice board, electronic sort of notice board, where you could post messages. And someone once posted a message saying, you can post whatever you like on here, but you mustn't talk about religion. That was really weird. You could talk about anything, but not religion. Anything goes, don't talk about God. We don't want to talk about God. Church is sort of very easy to be viewed as sort of like the bingo of society, you know, just something for a little bit of fun. It's a, it's a pastime. It's a way of meeting people. Uh, and it's mocked constantly. Now, you and I hear that message loud and clear day after day, but it is not true. So one day, um, it was a Wednesday afternoon, I was studying down at Oak Hill, and Wednesday afternoons we used to have these um, sort of small group times. And um, sometimes we'd study the Bible together, and sometimes we'd do something different. And someone in the group had this bright idea of, why don't we go and do bus stop evangelism. Let's give it a go. Go and talk to people. And bus stops are great places because people are standing there waiting for a bus and you've got a chance to talk to them. And if they run off, they miss their bus. So bus stop evangelism. Um, So we went down to Southgate Circus and um, a whole group of us, there must have been about 10 of us, and we spread out around the circus. And um, I knew how this was going to play out. You know, I knew a few awkward conversations and then we'd head back. And um, so I sort of steeled myself. Peer pressure is an amazing thing. I steeled myself at a conversation. I went up to this young chap. I reckon he was 18 or 19. And um, I went up and I said, um, Hi, uh, from the Theological College just up the road. And we just sort of wanted to have conversations with people to find out what um, they thought about God. And, you know, you're sort of expecting him to, when you mention the G word. Do you know what he said? He said, um, Oh, it's, it's very... It's actually very strange you should ask me that. Um, I have, I've just been, just been thinking that through. He starts getting books out of his bag. I've just been thinking that through. See, I do believe in God, but I'm pretty sure God would want to have nothing 
to do with me. Now I felt so condemned in that moment. Actually, I, I scanned round Southgate Circus, all round the circus. People were having conversations with people. Don't believe the lie. Every day we're told people don't want to speak about God. People don't want to know about him. No one's interested. I want to say that is a complete lie. Remember my friend Chris? John, like, is there some way we can just find out a bit more about this Jesus guy? Or or the company director feeling guilty, wanting to know if there's any hope in this world? This is what we've got to offer. Have a look down. We're going to land here. Verse 21. If ever there was a verse in the Bible to commit to memory, this is it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him, it's talking about Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Is that not the best news for broken people? That is what my company director needed to hear. God made him who had no sin, for, uh, no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Can you see, we, there is a situation far worse than Ebola in this world. And the Creator God has given the cure to you and to me. If you know and trust Jesus, he's given it to you. And he says, go and be a missionary for me. Whatever your context, whoever it is you're going to see tomorrow, go and be a missionary. Let Christ's love compel you. Be confident that God will work through you and love those that you're speaking to. I'm going to suggest, I know we find this hard, and... um, I'd love this to be more of a dialogue. I'm going to suggest, why don't we just turn in twos and threes and maybe just just ask yourself two questions. Ask yourself, what is the challenge for you here? What do you find hard? And ask yourself, what is the context God is calling you to be a missionary in? Maybe think of something very specific. It might be a friend. It might be a family situation. What is the context God is calling you to be a missionary in? Just take a couple of minutes, and then we're going to um, turn it to prayer. Happy to chat to someone nearby? You can just sit on your own if you want. That would be fine. No one will mind. Let's turn and chat.
interrupt. I'm guessing you, like me, feel the great need for God's help here. Um, We know he promises to help us. He sends his spirit to empower us, to give us boldness and courage. Um, So I'm going to suggest we just, um, instead of having prayers from the front tonight, um, why don't we turn and pray, maybe back in your twos and threes. You don't all have to pray. Maybe there'll be uh, one or two of you in the groups who are willing to just say a short prayer, and the rest of you can say a hearty amen to encourage. Let's ask God to help us be missionaries. And um, then on your way out, you can graffiti your name on the, the missionary notice. Actually, don't do that. I'd get into all kinds of trouble. Uh, but let's pray. Let's ask God for, for his help.